Well, good morning, Clear Creek. Good morning. I was just thinking about what to say to chastise the ones who aren't here so that you could pass that along, and about half our congregation came in at the last minute. <laughs> and so uh, I was going to ask you, what would you be if you weren't in chapel today? And the answer is, y'all would be ashamed. Uh, so I would encourage you for being here and welcome you into the Lord's house. I know that Dr. Smith is going to introduce our speakers uh, for today uh, in just a little while, but I wonder, do we have other guests with us that uh, would make yourself known that we could recognize you? Must be home folks today then. We welcome you into the Lord's house. Uh, I want to lead us just in a brief word of prayer, and then I have uh, three presentations that I need to make and uh, some exemplary students that we want to point out to you and recognize their good efforts today. But first, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, you are the God of all things, and certainly you are the Lord of this day, and you have given it to us. And God made this opportunity that we could assemble together, that we could worship and adore you, that we could sing your praises, we could fellowship, we could hear a word from your servant. Uh, and God, in this service, take an opportunity to notice someone who has went an extra mile in serving and preparing for service to you. So, God, we just ask that you would take all this and receive it as a sweet savor that would rise up to you, as you mentioned in your word. We pray that anything that we have brought in this place that would stand between us and the blessing that you have for us pointed out to us. And, God, before you even do, we agree with you that you are right and ask you to forgive us wherever we fall short. So, Lord, let us lift up to you clean hands today in this service, in service and in worship to you. In Jesus' precious name we pray, and amen. amen. I do have a few awards to uh, confer. Uh, the first one is the Lewis Lynch Memorial Scholarship, and this award is in recognition of a third-year student for effective Christian ministry while attending Clear Creek Baptist Bible College. And this award, this award is presented to Mr. Tanner McDowell. <laughs> Tanner's traveling a long way to receive this award today, all the way from the sound room. I'll back in the back. Thank you very much. And then this award <clears throat> is the Billy Lynn Terry Memorial Scholarship in recognition of a fourth year student for leadership and dedication to youth ministry while attending Clear Creek Baptist Bible College. And this award today goes to Mr. Andrew Tucker. And then one more to award the Edgar Mitchell Family Scholarship. This is in recognition of a fourth year student for stability, positive attitude, good academic standing, integrity, and proper dress while attending Clear Creek Baptist Bible College. And this goes to Mr. Caleb Davis. Again, traveling far to receive this award. Thank you. And our camera is right that way. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. Nix, I'll turn it over to you. Well, congratulations, everybody. Um, Caleb has to get back there to turn my mic up a little bit, I bet. Um, so we'll give him a second. But uh, we're so glad that you all are here with us again this morning to worship our Savior. And um, like I said on Monday, uh, we'll sing a congregational song. And then we have two songs of groups that audition to go to the uh, KBC. And they're going to uh, sing those for us. But let's begin by standing together and singing to our Savior. 
What a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine, leaning on the everlasting arms. Thank you, Father. And now we're going to enter into our time of prayer. So however the Lord leads you, sitting, standing, come to this altar. Let us go before the Lord in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning, and I pray that that song we just sang, I know it's one that we've probably all sung in our churches for years, but Lord, I pray we don't lose the, lose the message of it, that we need to be leaning on you every day, Lord, for you are the one that sustains us. And so, God, I thank you so much for each individual here that's present. God, I pray for the ministries represented here, Lord, and um, these students studying for future ministry possibilities. And, Lord, this side of heaven, we may never know the impact it's going to have. But, God, in a room this size, Lord, we ask your blessing upon it. Let us go out as the 12 did and change this world for your glory and yours alone. And, God, as we continue in this time of worship today, we give you and you alone the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you may stand as we sing this song, I have my mic on. Check. Okay. You have been a dwelling place, O oh, everlasting God. Before you formed the mountain tops, you were before it all. And soon our lives turn back to dust. And when the sun comes up, For the day has passed us by Before our hearts forget All your goodness Satisfy us with your love Sing the wrath of God The wrath of God sin on Jesus crucified. Consider
on earth and give us more wisdom in the secret heart as you display amazing grace in Jesus Christ for us sing teach us and teach us Lord to number our days on earth Sweet through 
pray with me. Dearly Father, I just want to come to you and say thank you uh, for the mercy tree and also thank you for your resurrection and giving us new life through your Holy Spirit. I just pray that as we go throughout the rest of the semester that we will praise you um, and not forget what you've done for us. And I just praise you today. In Jesus name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Well, it is exciting day to be back in chapel here at Clear Creek Baptist Bible College. It is that time of year when we have mission chapels. As you know, we've seen it in our emails. We announced it on Tuesday. Uh, we are in the process of collecting the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. Uh, we are grateful for your generous uh, giving to the Eliza Broad Estate Missions offering. We were able to uh, meet our goal, and we pray that the same will be true uh, when it comes to the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. With that said, these two today are special missionaries. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, the call of God to be missionaries, as I understand it, is what brought Dr. Uh, Charles Stargell and his wife Sherry to our area, to Barberville, Kentucky, where he practices medicine and uh, serves as a medical doctor, but they also have a heart for the nations. And so you're going to hear today as they come and share with us uh, about how that God has used them and continues to use them and ways in which they see God moving all around um, the world today. They are members of First Baptist Church, Barberville, and Dr. Stargell as well is a Gideon. I think the last two years in May, you've shared uh, in our church and blessed our folks uh, with the Gideon report there. And so I want you to listen to them as they come and share today what God has uh, put on their heart. Give them a clear creek welcome. Y'all come on. If anybody didn't get a handout, uh, Brother Josh, would you just make sure that... There are some in the back, and Brother Josh will have a couple if you um, happened in late after we came by. Um, 
as is my habit to still our hearts before the Lord, I'm going to join our sister in leading you in prayer again, because um, you'll know by the end um, of our time together that uh, our hearts are for prayer and for the nations. Um, so let us pray again. Almighty God, you um, have created these mountains um, around us, and we stand in awe of you. Your holiness, you deserve reverence that we often take from you. And so, God, we ask that you would forgive us. We ask, God, that um, you would receive our genuine thanks for Jesus, for his sacrifice for each one of us who follow him. And Holy Spirit, as the song said, we ask that you would fill us and fill this place, each one of us, that um, from this time that we spend together, you would forever change us because we've encountered you and your word. We ask these things in the power of our mighty Savior's name. Amen. Whether, therefore, ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. 1 Corinthians 10.31. And that is our family's verse. Whatever. That would be the response that our kids would give. <laughs> Whatever. It includes a whole lot of things, right? Besides eating and drinking. For you, hopefully if somebody comes up to you who's not at chapel today, um, you won't give that response, but you'll give, wow, God is good. And he has been so very good to us, and we want to testify of that today. But also, we want to um, have you uh, be able to share with them some principles and things that God has worked through our lives and um, really from our failures in a lot of ways um, so that um, hopefully um, a process will begin that um, will continue. We are so honored to be able to share with you a little bit um, today from our lives, and thank you so much for inviting us. What we'll be sharing about in our lives are things that we learn to be intentional about, but we also want to encourage you and challenge you um, in your parenting and marriages, if you are at that stage of your lives, um, to encourage you in your walk with the Lord and to challenge the application of Scripture to live on mission and to pray for revival. But as a teacher, I couldn't let you get out of here without some homework. So there are some resources for you to pick up as you leave, and that, where they will challenge you as well. They challenged us a lot as we went through them. And we mostly hope that you can say by the end of this that God received glory this morning. Faith stories are a great place to begin, really in any relationship. Recently, we had the privilege of inviting some kids from Union College um, it, over to our house, um, first to church and then for lunch. It's been a habit that we've done for a long time. And um, we asked them to share their Jesus story. So the fantastic part about that is that as um, I was going back and looking at my quiet time, um, the verse I put on your handout, 2 Corinthians 3.3, 3, I wrote in the margin, each of our stories is unique, but beautifully similar because the hero of the story is Jesus. So for me, I was out running last week, and uh, I was at Thompson Park, and as I came down the back straightaway, there was a really strong wind, and it reminded me of a faith evangelism story that I learned um, several uh, years back, probably a decade and a half or two. I mean, we're old, let's be honest. So, but uh, that, that back uh, wind probably cost me the five seconds that I didn't make the time I was going for, right? And so it reminded me that um, my parents grew up in um, Russell Springs, and I was born in Somerset, but God moved us to the Midwest where the winds are really strong. And I was a pretty rebellious, even pre-K kid, and I ran away from home. And I got about halfway up the street, and I had to turn around. What an amazing visualization of repentance. And I went back home. It wasn't difficult sometime thereafter when in a children's church service, um, they presented the gospel that Jesus died for our sins for me to see that I was headstrong and independent and rebellious and to ask Jesus to save me. 
After that, I was baptized, and through my teenage years, I really struggled with assurance of my salvation for several reasons, but I was blessed to be able to um, really get some good training and um, learn the scriptures. And in college, regrettably, I spent a lot of days not filled with the Spirit. For those times, as I look back, I um, continue to understand and process God's um, brokenness, brokenness for my own sinfulness and contriteness. But I also um, just am blessed that God is faithful. He does keep his promises. He forgives our sins. My story begins in my home, like many of you. Um, I grew up in a Christian home, and at some point during my latter elementary years, we went to have some special meetings at our church, and I realized that Jesus wasn't my Savior. So I didn't walk forward like many people did. I went back to my parents, went home with them, and my dad led me through the plan of salvation and then the prayer to ask Jesus to be my Savior. Um, I uh, went to Sunday school and training union, and I just aged myself, if you know that term. And, but it wasn't until I was in high school and going through a time of doubting that a pastor challenged me to start growing and to have a quiet time. And I'm still learning that. Um, in fact, earlier, um, well, last week, I went to a strong prayer warrior in our church. I went to her house, an older lady, and I just said, teach me how you spend your time in prayer and um, how you have that focused prayer time. And so I'm just still learning what all that exactly means. But shortly after my pastor challenged me to grow, my youth group went on a mission trip. And through various circumstances that only God could arrange, he called me to work with deaf people. Um, and you'll hear a little bit more about that part of my life and a little bit later in this. Um, but earlier in my testimony, notice that I said that we had special meetings. Um, it was officially called at that church the fall revival. But God and I, God taught Charles and I early in our marriage what true revival really is. And you can't put that on a calendar. Um, God used um, Life Action Summit to get a hold of our hearts, and since that time, early in our marriage, um, our lives and our focus have been forever changed. So God affirmed our authentic and genuine Christianity during those times, but also grew us. I was an intern, and I was working over 100 hours a week. Um, I wasn't able to go to the first week of the meetings that were planned for two weeks, but on that Saturday, I was able to um, attend a marriage and parenting seminar um, that God has continued to work through um, our life and our family these last 32 plus years since then. Um, and it's just been really amazing to see how God has um, taken those principles from his word, um, some of which we'll share with you in just a little while, and um, to have worked them through um, in um, a life process. Um, we have truly tried to live out... Um a mission statement? You can say that mission statement for us. Yes, yes I can. <laughs> um, so one of the things that happened for me personally was um, kind of what you guys already experienced because of the worship that you have here. But for me, I grew up singing those hymns, and um, and God just really began to help me learn to not in a prideful way, but to insert myself in those songs um, to to really personally worship. And in my quiet times, I was always taught to to study the Bible every day and to spend time with God, but I just really didn't personally worship. And so we were challenged um, early on um, at some points to like have a family verse and also to have a family mission statement. And I'd encourage you guys to do that personally. And then as God forms families, um, for those of you who are single, but um, there was a song that was sung then that we'd never heard and we had to go back and, and listen to it again and again. But if you ask our kids now, they'd say, that's our family mission statement. All, all that stuff you, uh, all that verbiage you tried to give us. So that song says, to love the Lord our God is the heartbeat of our mission. The spring from which our service overflows. Across the street or around the world, the mission's still the same. Proclaim and live the truth in Jesus' name. And we tried to do that in our family and with our kids. We went on domestic and international mission trips. Um, we tried to serve in our own community. Um, but also discipleship became very important to us. Um, I started teaching sign language classes at our church then. Um, I interpreted our church in Georgia um, 
we went through experiencing God, and eventually we led experiencing God there. Um, he was in medical school and then the military, so he traveled. So eventually we taught it in Georgia, Louisiana, eventually here in Kentucky. Um, and we were we intentionally looked for ways to grow and to be challenged um, and then to teach because the point of discipleship is to become disciple makers. So there were a lot of different areas, LifeWay courses, other things like financial stewardship. One thing that um, stands out in particular, um, we were uh, very interested, of course, that first um, time I told you about because we had one child, but now we're expecting our second. And one of the Christian pediatricians in our church um, had a Saturday seminar, and he uh, had us down in the basement of the church, and um, he said, what's the number one goal of your parenting? And it was silent. And nobody spoke. And he's like, it's okay. You're in a church. You can say it. That your kids will know Jesus and follow him just like you do. So there were things like that. Uh, really meeting needs and sharing Christ was one of those really strong kind of formative things for us. But God began to develop our heart for missions. And when we moved to Louisiana, um, we hooked up with a group um, at that point, Baptist Medical and Dental Mission, that was headed towards um, Central America. And Sherry and I got to go on our first mission trip when we, she was expecting our, um, our first son. Um, I have to tell you just a, a quick caveat, because through the years, you see God working in the nations growing his kingdom, doing things that only he can do. And one of those trips, I was able to go with one of my brothers through some circumstance um, in our family. We ended up taking guardianship of my two teenage brothers. And um, God just really grew us and challenged us again. I mean, we would literally, in medicine, we say, uh, you know, see one, do one, teach one. And that's what we felt like in, in parenting those young teenagers or older teenagers, really. And so I got to live out life on mission, taking them. And I'm sitting there in the medical clinic, and I'm basically watching God birth a church around me. It was amazing. And um, he, people just kept coming to the Lord while they were waiting to see the doctor when they were at the pharmacy in the services at night. Several years later, I was able to go back and um, a young man who was saved there went someplace like this, got Bible training, became the pastor. Teams went back, discipled people. The guy that was the mayor of the town had attended college in the United States, and at the end of that week, he said, all we knew was a dead religion, and you brought to us a living faith in Jesus. It, it was amazing. Um, when we went back, the, the teams had gone, and they built a, a, a church building, and then later a ministry center to reach out to their community. It's just something that only God can do. Yes. For um, our um, significant anniversaries, we have chosen to serve together. Um, so for part of our 25th anniversary, we taught a marriage seminar in Cambodia um, with some first-generation believers because of Khmer Rouge. Um, removing culture from marriage principles and teaching only biblical principles was really challenging and it challenged us and it, and it helped us. But part of that trip, we also um, went to Nepal. So I was invited by a Clear Creek professor at the time who was my patient and um, has now gone on to be with the Lord. And um, I was able to go and um, we actually hooked up with a medical organization, part of a medical organization, Go International, um, from up in um, around Asbury. And um, it, it, it was a life changing experience. I've been back to Nepal to that orphanage five times. Um, this trip with Sherry, one of my favorite um, things is that she invested a lot in training to learn community health um, education and evangelism that can be useful in um, closed countries. Um, and uh, I remember one particular time that I, I needed something from the pharmacy. So um, I got up from the crowd and fought through the uh, big open air uh, thing, went over where the pharmacy was, and she wasn't there, but I took care of what I needed to. And I was caught by surprise because there were people sitting up on the roof on the opposing building. Does that sound kind of biblical or mm -hmm. what, right? And um, so then um, I peeked around the corner of that building, and I see my wife sitting in the dirt, 
um, with a circle of ladies, one of the Bible college students who were our interpreters that she had previously in the week trained to teach those evangelism lessons and those health education lessons. And um, just those kinds of precious treasures that God gives you. What, what I want to ask you is, would you consider honoring the legacy of that Clear Creek professor and what God's doing in Nepal? My friend that uh, was the doctor on that trip with me is still in Lexington, and he's joined an organization, and their goal is to reach every village in Nepal with the gospel by the year 2025. Sherry and I also are blessed to um, have been a part of something called Good News Healthcare Ministries that um, did medical clinics for over a decade for underinsured and uninsured people on Saturdays in our local churches. We've um, recently um, seen God reactivate that um, ministry with the purpose of doing missions and this kind of health education to um, propagate the gospel. Yes. So this year, we celebrated our 35th anniversary. So we went to three countries. Um, the first was to Israel, which had been a dream of ours for decades. And um, although this was the touristy part of our trip, we had intentionally set up some meetings um, to encourage some missionaries, um, journeymen that we knew there through our daughter-in-law. Um, we ended up through that whole trip, through all three countries, ended up like encouraging around nine or so missionaries and meeting with them and praying with them and um, being challenged by them. And um, But one of the things that we did was our, our daughter served with IMB, and she um, had a connection with a Russian Jew who had married a Jewish man and moved to Israel. And they were both very excited because we were going to go and we were going to meet them, and they took us to dinner. And we talked with them, and Charles just happened to mention, you know, I was reading in the Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 18, 18 this morning about a prophet who is foretold, you know, capital P prophet. And they were so surprised. You read our scriptures? We were like, yeah, yeah, we do. We read those. And they were just interested in talking with us and um, invited us to share more information with them with us later so we were just excited we were able to water some of the seeds that our daughter had um, planted and um, so I'm going to ask you if just if you can write it down as Anna and Mushi that you would pray for them and that they would truly come to know the prophet it turns out that they invited us to come for Shabbat, um, but we weren't able to work it into our plans. But um, just the fact that we often make our plans, but God directs our steps. And in missions, um, people would say flexibility, flexibility, flexibility. And we were... I mean, we were going and we were going to meet with a journeyman and, and um, try to encourage her. And, um, and God gave us opportunity through what we call faith flag to share the gospel with and encourage this young couple. Um, there, there were several other things that happened on that trip that we would love to be able to tell you, but what, what I want to focus on is um, that journeyman, as we sat with her and prayed, encouraged us, please don't ride the bus to the Lake of Galilee tomorrow. Please get a cab. And God was in that. And so this Muslim cab driver picked us up, and we went um, first to this place of peace. It's basically a museum, and part of one of the rooms you put on goggles, and you literally look at things from the perspective of the three different major religions in Israel. And so we invited him in with us. We paid his admission. He got to see a boat that was like the ones that, that had been raised from um, the bottom of the sea, and you know, it was, it was a great um, opportunity. It was during Ramadan, and so we knew a lot of Christians were praying, um, and I even went one time and tried to give him water. Did you guys know that Muslims don't even drink water during the daytime? You know, I told Sherry the other night, um, I, I was finishing a fast, and um, I was like, I ate like a Muslim all night long. <laughs> <laughs> But this guy down. turned down the water and said, no, no, fasting. And we had a lot of communication problems. We were using Google Translate a lot. Um, but then we came to Magdala. And there was a picture there, and it was in Hebrew and English, um, and it told the story of Jesus and why Jesus came. It was amazing. And Sherry had the idea, why don't we snap a picture of that, put it in Google Translate? He sat down and read the gospel. The missionaries work for 
months and months to get that kind of opportunity. And, and we've been in all kinds of major religion settings, and we've never had an opportunity like that. It, it was truly amazing. And he was so grateful at the end that he wanted to take us and get us uh, kanafi, which is this amazing dessert. Um, and he's like, it's almost as good as my mother's. <laughs> yes. Um, when we left Israel, we went to North Africa and visited with our son and daughter-in-law who are with the IMB there as journeymen. And lastly, we went to Central Asia, and that is where I spent three and a half weeks. Um, Charles was only spend, able to spend about 10 days and had to come back to work. Um, but there, I partner with a team that works with the Deaf Affinity Group. And in the past, um, I taught deaf students. Um, I interpreted for a while when we were in Georgia. I used sign as a creative ministry. Um, I taught um, the youth um, in homeschool groups some sign. Um, but then after staying at home and teaching my kids for 25 years, God has now given us the opportunity to kind of focus on that part of the ministry. While we were in Central Asia, I started learning the local sign language there, um, going on trips into the city to, um, to find deaf people and meet them. Um, God has a good sense of humor and timing. I had had one lesson. I'd learned the alphabet and the numbers. And we go after that first lesson to get on a bus to go home, and there were two deaf guys signing. And so I said, oh, I walked up to him, I said, is this, this is going to be 8A? <laughs> they were like, oh, yeah. So since they knew I knew a little bit, then we started using Google Translate and doing that over and over. And I got their contact information to be able to pass along after I knew the alphabet and the numbers. It was, it was amazing. Um, when... Um, I returned back to Central Asia in August, um, just I did, to help with a conference for the whole affinity group. And I met all of the people from the IMB from all over the world that work with the deaf affinity group, all 26 of them, 26 for the whole world, for the millions of deaf people. Um, we've had the privilege of going to several commissionings, and um, we will go in at the end. They have the affinity groups and the, the flags lined up, and there's people for this affinity group and this affinity group and this affinity group. The deaf affinity group, neither time had people standing by there. People do not feel called for whatever reason or comfortable with that group of people. And, and that breaks my heart, to be honest with you, because that's, that's where my heart is. Um, when, well, what I want to do is actually challenge you. If you don't know what God has called you to do and where to consider the deaf affinity group, you don't have to know sign language. Just like hearing people, you have to go to that country and learn that language anyway. And to be honest with you, it's been harder for me to learn the sign language in Central Asia than otherwise because I already know I, my ASL gets all mixed up in it. Um, and we need young men because it's mostly girls who feel comfortable or called. And just like those young men that were on the bus, there was the only person that I could, that could meet with them because you can't ask 20 year olds to go meet with 20 year old girls and guys. Is, was a 30, 40 year old missionary that's there. And um, so we need some young guys to be able to engage. Even if it's the journeyman program for two years, um, that's what um, several of the girls are there, journeymen for two years, um, that um, were burdened because they went to, they were called to be journeymen, and they went to Richmond for the training, and they realized there the, the great need for working with the deaf, and that's what they chose to do. So I'm also going to ask you to pray for the Deaf Affinity Group and pray for workers for this group. And by the way, that cab driver's name is Sa'am, S-A-A-M, if you want to pray that God um, works in Muslims' hearts, just like Sa'am, that have heard or encountered the gospel, that um, it would bring forth fruit um, for the kingdom. God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that you having all sufficiency in all things can abound to every good work. If you'll ask God for special grace, then he'll give you his desire and his Holy Spirit's power to accomplish his will. We um, want to transition to um, a time that um, will basically just be very quick. Each of these um, pearls, if you will, um, would be something that uh, you could spend a whole um, seminar on. And uh, down deep in one of these pockets is supposed to be a pearl I can hold up. But just imagine, <laughs> in medicine, we uh, use a term for little nuggets of truth, things that we want to pass on to our students, or um, things that uh, we, we can't forget. 
And um, each of these could um, really be um, something that you could spend some time on. Some of them have to do with marriage and family, but look, this is my closest neighbor. And remember, Jesus told us to love our neighbor as ourself. So for even those of you who are single, these um, five things will um, have some bearing. Um, one of the first is daily devotions. And with our children, um, I don't think we've said we have seven, um, that um, they would say, what, what's dad's favorite thing to say or to ask? Have you had your quiet time today? And that would be what he would ask them all the time. He also modeled it very well. He was an excellent model. The kids would get up in the mornings, and he would be having his quiet time and prayer time. But he also taught it at the breakfast table. Each morning we read a psalm and or a proverb and discussed that. And so our, our kids learned how to read the scripture and then make application with that. Um, I usually have my quiet time at night. That's what worked for me when the kids were growing up. And so I just encourage you with your quiet time to find what works for you to do the private worship, like um, Charles mentioned, corporate worship is important, and to um, keep that balance with your life of quiet time and how important that is in your life. Okay. So uh, it's said of one of the great preachers of old that um, his family would have to make excuse to him, even if it was an extremely important visitor, because he would excuse himself at nine o'clock every night and say, I have a, an appointment. And people would like say, an appointment with who this time of night, right? But it was his time in his prayer closet with God. Ministry will get very busy. Family can get very busy. Protect your quiet time with God. And when... Um, it comes to balance. As a family doc, I can't help but also say, please make time for exercise, sleep well, rest, take times away, um, eat healthily, um, bring balance, and don't make your spouse be your accountability partner. Have somebody else that's a Barnabas to you and switch that person around so they don't get too comfortable with you. And then also, please have a Timothy. Build into that person in your life. Release them and ask God to send you another Timothy. Don't always strive to be the Paul. Have a mentor as well, even as you get more um, along in ministry. Yes, one of the things that we did um, to help keep balance in our marriage and um, so forth was to have times away um, with each other. And when the kids were growing up, we did it twice a year in the spring and the fall. And we would go away for just a night or two, but we would focus on our marriage. Um, we often read a book um, about marriage or parenting while we were away. And, um, and it just kind of showed the, the supremacy of the marriage relationship in the family to our children. We were trying to model that. Um, but it was also the way that we loved each other well was just having that time where we could really focus on each other. Um, so a practical thing for loving each other well, um, that I was just, the other day I was, actually we were doing something and I, and I thought about this, was to enjoy what your spouse enjoys. So last week we were hiking and Charles loves hiking. He goes in the cold, he goes in the heat, he takes back, he loves, I don't know so much about that. And um, so, but, Last week, um, the trees were beautiful, so we drove up close to Cumberland Falls and went on a short hike for my benefit, and, um, and it was beautiful, and I loved it, and I had a great time that day. Um, Recently, we just finished a Hallmark series. Yeah. Just have to do I know. it sometimes. And, and, and you enjoyed it, yeah? I, and he I enjoyed did it. enjoy it. He enjoyed it. it. He did. We also, we also like to read books together, and, um, or we read books, but what we do together is listen to an audio book. So when we're traveling or doing things, and sometimes when we're just around the house, we'll listen to an audio book together so that we're enjoying that together. So uh, I can still remember the time and the place where a guy said, do you pray with your wife every day? I'm like, no, nobody ever told me I was supposed to. <laughs> I went to Promise Keepers, did all this stuff in the 90s. Nobody ever told me that. So let me just say, have somebody that you can really share the intimate things of your life with and pray with. Um, and sometimes uh, in family, that's going to be agonizing and, and weeping over how to deal with a child or um, an adult children, a child or 
having to do with your grandkids now for us. Um, we really um, want to uh, conclude today with a focused time of prayer. And um, Sherry's going to uh, just spend a, a moment, and then I'm going to instruct you guys, and she's going to read a scripture about how we'd like to close this time today. Okay. You can go ahead and talk about you the do that. individual relationships. Okay, I think yeah. Some- Most of the things that we're discussing with you are things that we're still on the journey with, and we're still learning. Um, but parenting, we're, we're done with, and um, we are their friends and counselors when they ask. Uh, we strive to be intentional grandparents, and if you want to see pictures, ask me afterwards. I have a few. And, um, and so I just wanted, for you who have parents or will be parents, um, I just want to give you a bullet list real quick about the things that we really try to be intentional about. Um, We, to encourage their quiet time, we bought age-appropriate devotional books for them each Christmas to have for the next year. Um, We prayed about their method of schooling, including college. They had different kids did different things. Um, We helped them identify their spiritual gifts for their benefit, but also for us to help and train them in their bent. And um, we took them on mission trips, domestic and international. And um, we were also very intentional about their entertainment. Um, movies, TV, music, and when we would go out um, for a movie afterwards, we'd often go get a treat, sit down and talk to them about um, what was in the movie that was redeeming, what was it was very worldly and evil, and then teach them to process through that, to learn to have a biblical worldview and to engage the culture. Um, we were intentional about conferences, youth camps. We went to Kentucky Chamber Changers. We went to family camps. Um, But here's the deal. We knew that we were not perfect parents. We knew that there were things that we did incorrectly or things that we left out that we should have. So we quite regularly would pray for um, God to fill in the gaps. And so um, as we approach that, let me just say... um, I was blessed to get challenged to learn to fast and pray and learn that spiritual discipline, but I didn't put it into practice for a very long time. Often it takes something desperate because Jesus told us this kind comes not out except by prayer and fasting. So um, I would love to share more about that if you're interested, but the, the bottom line is that Um, For instance, uh, our daughter just got her driver's license, and she was going off on a mission trip. And it's like uh, she was going to drive through two major cities and had her sister with her. And dad needed to fast and pray that day. It was beneficial for me, right? So the fast that God honors is an important uh, concept. But um, just um, to to learn, um, because the bridegroom has gone, but he's coming again. And so that is the spirit of how I want us to approach these um, last few minutes together. Um, I have uh, a few cards. I'm going to ask you guys to divide into like three to five um, groups of three to five and just spend a little focused time in prayer. And I'm going to just ask Sherry. um, I was listening to a gospel song this morning. It was like... um, Come now, Lord, Um, now is the time for revival. And um, so for each of um, these groups, somebody read the scripture. If you're having a hard time with understanding sins of omission, think about prayerlessness. Mm -hmm. Um, Think about um, bearing one another's burdens or loving one another well. Um, Those are great places to start. But on the back of that paper is like practical stuff from um, applying Romans 6. Put off this. But the put on stuff is the stuff that we often neglect, right? The sense of omission. And I hope that um, Sherry will have a few cards here, but at least one person in the group um, read the scripture. One person pray a prayer of uh, personal or corporate repentance um, for um, the church. There's um, plenty to pray through. Somebody be bold enough in that group to confess your sin, your fault, one to another, and get God's healing, please. And then also, please, somebody pray for revival. Um, So, uh, God, we ask that you would do it again. Second Chronicles 7.14 says, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, and will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. So we're going to ask about 10 or 12 of you. Why don't 
happens, great. If not, you're fasting and praying. If you're still here at night, they will turn the lights out, I promise. And if God shows up like he did in Asbury in 1970, then he'll be glorified. You took my cards. Uh, Where are your cards? <laughs> I, I my, my bad, guys. I took hers, so here we go. Yeah. 